So, uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, welcome to the eyes are the windows to, to soul. So um, today we'll actually be sharing how eye tracking technology actually helps with user testing, even when you're in an agile environment. So I'll start off with an explanation of how eye tracking actually works. And then um, Yvonne from GoBack, uh, which is actually the senior VP of IT and development there, um, who's actually also one of our uh, business partners. Uh, we'll actually elaborate further on their case study of how they actually used um, eye tracking to generate um, insights for them and how they used it um, for their own solutions as well. So how many of you here have actually heard of eye tracking before? Have, oh, that's a lot. Have used eye tracking before? Okay, um, only well, two. Coincidence? <laughs> Just a yellow wearing, yellow t-shirt wearing guys. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So just as an introduction, so uh, basically objective experience is actually a customer and user experience consultancy and we actually started first in Sydney back in 2007 and we expanded into Singapore in 2013. So today we are actually the leader in using eye tracking technologies, especially here in, um, in Australia and in Singapore from using it to actually understand the solution space in let's say ethnographic studies or you know, contextual interviews to actually using eye tracking for iterations of your websites and usability testings and user testings and we basically uncover insights to optimize the experience that your users actually have with your product or brand. So going into the usability testing sort of formats that we have So there is the full usability testing and there's Agile. So very often, um, many Agile development teams actually skip real live user testing because um, they have a perception that it takes up a lot of time um, and a lot of effort to do. And there are actually many user testing alternatives that actually helps with this. Some would be unmoderated uh, remote testing or even you can have guerrilla testing. However, with these methods, the physical interaction with real users actually gets lost. Um, the product development team, um, the designers can also get lost in translation when interpreting what the users are actually trying to say um, in, the, in the videos that you actually get back from such unmoderated remote testing even. So very often the method used for remote testing is actually also the think aloud process which actually also interferes with the actual task completion times, which I will go into a bit detail later. And in objective, a full in-lab usability testing for an evaluative or benchmarking purpose uh, is being used, can be used, and it requires many participants, usually up to 12, um, dependent on how many user groups that you actually want to test the app on. And the higher the number of participants, the more usability problems you are able to uncover. But the relationship between the sample size and the number of usability problems that is being discovered is actually an exponential one. So one of the early usability gurus, um, Jacob Nielsen, actually suggested that even with only five users, about 85% of usability problems actually can be found. And for those who think that user research is too costly and elaborate, a small and agile user research method with more frequent testings actually would suit better as many as the budget allows. And with Agile, you want to very quickly validate your product's um, core workflows or concepts and give your team a sense of where to focus next. And it is actually a repetitive process that you can schedule regularly. And it's not necessary for your product to even be completed in order to test. So you can even test using eye tracking, even on low fidelity prototypes. Like we have actually done eye tracking um, on paper prototypes even, on just wireframes alone. And that actually also um, helps. So at the end of the day, some testing is better than none at all. So how exactly does agile user testing work? So um, here's basically an overview of it. So there are three stages. And the preparation for it, the kickoff, actually takes about three to five days. And this can happen simultaneously as your design and development goes along. And that includes identifying any user needs or pain points that is to be addressed for the test, defining the research objectives and the tasks, and then um, recruiting the 
the actual users. And next would be the actual testing. And this is only a single day itself. So you test five people in a single day, and there will also be a workshop um, that will occur at the end of it, or even in between sessions, to actually uh, identify any key usability issues to fix and to actually brainstorm on the solutions right there on the spot within a single day. And then, if it is necessary, then on um, the next day, a report can be written to document down those uh, observations. But within your cycle itself, um, just basic testing alone itself is actually sufficient enough to, for you to go back to the drawing board and think about um, whether your products uh, whether of your prototypes concept and products pain points to fix. So going to a little bit more detail during the preparation stage. So planning and communication are actually the keys to conducting a great agile user research. So early strategizing occurring at the previous development cycle actually also helps. And all of this information and ideas in the early planning phase should be communicated frequently to the user research team or um, if you only have one researcher, that researcher themselves, so that any issues can be ironed out quickly and for resource management to occur efficiently. And the difference between agile and full user research is that there will actually be less tasks to cover. So instead of maybe covering five user flows, you prioritize three main tasks. Uh, to look at. So we break that journey down um, and prioritize all the main tasks to look at so that you look at small things at uh, one go. And the selection of tasks will actually depend on the project team's objectives as well as any identified user needs or pain points from any other analytics, let's say Google Analytics. All of this is actually consolidated into a discussion guide or test script that actually helps structure the actual testing the next day. So the identification of target users, um, this can also come from previous research that you have done before to formulate, let's say, your personas, and, or it can even come from your marketing department even, or even your site analytics too, if it actually has demographic breakdowns. And then, uh, we think you go out to recruit these people. So you can do, there are different ways to recruit them. That you can do it intercept if your if the product that you're actually developing is general enough. You can go out and just grab people off the street or buy them a cup of Starbucks and sit with them at Starbucks to do it. And even with eye tracking, the technology is so compact that you can actually bring it around anywhere. And an objective, personally, uh, we already have a database of people we recruit from. So, and if there isn't enough that matches the profile from within the database, we will head out to actually solicit these people. So there is always a ready group of people that you can actually test with. So, when it comes to testing, when all the preparation is done, the testing is next. Typically, it's always an hour long. Uh, and the moderator or the researcher will actually elicit insights from the tested users. So it is actually mandated um, within objective to that the product design and development team members have to sit in and observe all the testing sessions. Why do we do this? Why is it compulsory for them to sit in? That's because we believe that the project team members are the expert as well. And they can then immediately get a sense of what users actually need and iterate on the spot or the next day even. And how do they get immediate insights then? That's where eye tracking comes into play. It is actually used as a way to gain direct insight into how the product is being used and to see what users actually struggle with. Eye tracking allows observers of the testing to see the user's unconscious behavior in real time. And that's the life viewing and it enables Stakeholders actually make instant decisions about solutions to interface problems. So some of you may um, have used or seen eye tracking before. Some of you, most of you, have not. Uh, but there is always that misconception that eye tracking is all about heat maps. Um, it's actually not. Uh, there is a way to qualitatively use eye tracking to actually get your user insights. So um, just. 
very briefly. In the past, eye tracking hardware. So this is actually how all this eye tracking hardware has been uh, developed before. And you can see that it's very intrusive, it's very complex and complicated. Most of them are actually head mounted. And there's so many components sticking um, in and outside of your face. But right now, it's so mobile and lightweight. You barely even see the eye tracker um, in these pictures. And it can be easily uh, packed to travel around with as well. So let's consider how we actually process information. So there's the conscious level where most conventional UX um, user experience research methods actually rely on like self-reporting during an interview or survey which relies on human recall and that's um, that's subject to a lot of biasness, so like social desirability bias, that like people actually um, tell you what you what they think that you actually want to hear instead of um, their actual behavior. So even for think about, the user actually has consciously think and phrase their sentences to tell you what they know or don't know. So with eye tracking, it taps into the subconscious, unconscious level and gives valuable insights into how people view react and interpret stimuli. And visual behavior is actually not something that can be easily controlled even when people know that their eyes are being tracked. So the eyes actually move very, very fast. And that's, um, your eyes actually move between 20 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds all the time. And once your eye moves, it actually cannot be altered at will. The brain does not utilize continuous feedback. And when there is continuous tracking of error, um, sorry, when there is continuous tracking of error, but rather responds to the eyes drift away from the target intermittently in order to return the gaze to the target. So these are the usual um, usability testing methods. So there's the think aloud protocol. There's a retrospective think aloud where you just replay the video of what the person did. And then there's retrospective think aloud with eye tracking where you replay the video back to the user to get feedback. And with the eye tracking data, they can actually tell you exactly um, what they were doing at that point in time. So the normal thing a lot protocol has the user being tested thinking, uh, what am I doing? How do I explain it on top of trying to complete the task given? And that interferes with their task completion time as I mentioned before. Um, you actually don't exactly get a real sense of what uh, they can actually do in an actual situation. With retrospective think aloud, they will always be trying to recall what the I do just now. However, with eye tracking, they can immediately tell you, I looked at this because, uh, I looked at this during the test because of dot dot dot. So with eye tracking, the moderator or the researcher can just flow with the actual behavior of the user and the user can actually just explain why they looked at what they did for each task. So when it comes to eye tracking, the setup is as such. This is for mobile device testing. So the eye tracker is actually being placed at the bottom. And then there will be actually a camera at the top that actually captures an image of the phone. And the eye tracking data that is gathered from the tracker below is actually mapped onto the uh, image that's captured from the top camera. And this, this can be viewed in real time. So what exactly do you actually see? This is a video of um, what we did for Go Back. So you see the orange circles, that's the fixations. As the circle grows, it means the person actually looked at it a lot more. So if let's say you were testing whether the person actually looked at this area, which is the edit details and photo button, you can totally see that they weren't focusing there at all. And then even right from the video with the eye tracking, you actually notice that uh, the difference between the compare buttons, between the ticks, whether it's selected or not, is actually also not very obvious, which was something that actually could have changed. And for a website testing setup, um, 
this is how typically it will look like. So the test user is there, the researcher is here. This itself is just the eye tracker alone. And this would be how a website eye tracking video will actually look like. So this person is actually just comparing, and you can and you notice that her eyes are actually purely looking at the prices <laughs> and, the and not really looking at anywhere else. So you know immediately right from the get go what actually attracted their attention first. how I mentioned before that it's actually compulsory that every project team member, especially the designers and the developers, have to sit in to observe the testing sessions. So it's actually for this purpose that either in between sessions or at the end of all the sessions, the researcher or we call it the facilitator activity lead will actually sit together with the project team to discuss on the spot what was seen during the testing, digest what the users actually commented about, and then creatively think of solutions. So this actualizes the results um, for the next sprint. And this discussion is also, you can consider it like a debrief, um, and it can also be conducted like a workshop. And in Singapore, uh, we have facilitation cards, or conversation cards, as well as a catalyst wall, uh, basically a wall that actually lists out questions to think about, um, to have on the forefront of every project team member's minds even as all the testing sessions go on. And this is just basically to spark your brain juices to flow for solutions creation. So the solutions um, should not come from a single person alone. So it's not just a researcher's job to come up with the solutions. It's the whole team um, continuously together coming up with the solutions. And I guess uh, right from this morning's keynote, um, there was one thing that actually struck was collective wisdom uh, outweighs individual insight. And this is how um, this workshop, um, at the end of all testing, um, can actually work for that. And at the end, if whether it's required or not, uh, if it's required, it can be documented down so that um, it actually uh, is just probably a, just a list of a summarized findings so that um, the team can actually bring it uh, with them and even have kind of like a record for what they have done and so you can trace um, through a timeline what's being done and basically always we go back uh, when we work with go back uh, we actually have a separate meeting after to actually fully digest all any recommendations that's being given by the researcher as well as the team and then we can actually then prioritize which to take further or to A-B test. Um, so as uh, Lynette said, my name is Yvonne. Um, I work at Gobert. It's a fintech based in Singapore. Um, we have rolled out in several countries in the region and Every step of the way, uh, Lynette and her team has been supporting us to make sure that we're ready for uh, launching in all the new markets because there's also going to be cultural differences as um, maybe also lingual differences. Um, and some of the key findings uh, I'd like to share with you, which we actually changed uh, based on um, the eye tracking research. Um, some things we actually changed on the spot. So for example, we were in uh, Malaysia um, a couple of months ago and we saw that uh, a particular word did not appeal to users and we just directly, during the sessions, uh, changed the wording and saw an immediate effect um, for the rest of the day that people actually started noticing. So things are very, very small uh, when it comes to wording or maybe even a color and those things you can change on the spot during the testing day. Other things are a little bigger, so we also want to go ahead and add A-B test. So uh, to us, um, the, the whole testing and the whole eye tracking is, is a research phase. Uh, and only when you put those findings and recommendations to use will it actually be uh, valuable or not. You don't know. So what we do is we select 
um, the findings based on um, the research and then prioritize um, when it's a when it's a no-brainer and we know it's going to be um, uh, a lot better then we just go ahead and do it if we're not sure or there might be multiple options uh, we'll define a b tests so we'll take that recommendation and come up with two or three options and then a b test it first before we actually proceed to execution um, how many have you uh, have you ever heard of gobert in the first place so um, uh, just a brief introduction, because you guys just saw some videos. It's, uh, it's a comparison website, it's a meta search engine um, where consumers can actually compare financial products like insurance plans and banking products. Uh, so for us, it's, uh, it's, it's a double <coughs> challenge because it, meta search is quite new uh, in Asia. So for consumers to actually understand that it's a website where they can just compare but not buy anything, that's something that we also need to explain. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's convenient for them to be able to use it anywhere, anytime, but it is a new kind of product. So we try to separate the introduction of a new product or service compared to the actual usability. Um, so one of the things that we've noticed is that when people actually come onto the whole page, they would actually look at the, the grayed out area. So that's the form fill that actually attracts their attention, which is fine if they're, in this case, looking for travel insurance comparison. But we also want to tell them that it's not just travel insurance that Gobert compares, we also have other products. But what happened is they never saw the other tabs, or never, maybe that's too strong a word, but in a lot of cases they didn't see that we also have other products for them to compare. Um, so changing the wording or changing the color could have been an option, but we did it a little bit more drastically in this case. And we said, what if we just leave it as it is? But we add a top menu where we can actually group the different products, be it insurance or credit cards or loans, for, uh, for example. Uh, and what we saw uh, in the A-B test where we did it with iPads or just wording, which, who speaks Thai? Okay, sorry. So this is a Thai example um, where we actually tried it with just words or just icons or a combination of both. And what we noticed is that not the click-ins would actually improve or the conversion, which obviously is our our, our most important KPI, but what we did see is people actually clicking through to other products, which was our um, hypothesis. Um, so um, we, we, we implemented this in Thailand first, um, and it's, it's running now, it's been running for about a week and a half, and we can actually see that people are engaging more with other products on the GoBear platform. Um, so thanks to the, the insights that we got from the usability test, we were actually to, uh, we were able to solve this problem. Um, a second issue on the results page is that uh, on the desktop version, you needed a mouse over to be able to see uh, the more details button. Uh, but what happens is a lot of people actually use the mouse um, in conjunction with their eyes. So they use the mouse as sort of this, a kind of a pointer. Um, and what we notice is that it also interrupts um, the, the fact that they're looking at something and then there's a layover that just blocks the view of whatever they were looking at. Um, but we do want them to look at more details because that's where all the coverages are actually written out and you have policy details. Um, so we thought, how can we solve this without um, changing too much uh, on the results page? Um, so we came up with a design where there's actually, again, in Thailand, uh, where there's two buttons. So one is to actually go to that provider and the other one is to go to more details. Um, the conversion dropped. And that was to be expected because a lot of users actually clicked on that button before um, thinking that they would see more information about that specific product. So obviously, um, internally, we had quite a discussion when we launched this and we saw the conversion of like, did we do the right thing? Sometimes you also need to take a little bit of a, of a, of a drop down to be able to grow again after, because this does make sense for the end user. My business development colleagues weren't very happy, but it does make sense for the user because they're actually getting what they're expecting rather than being sent out to the provider where they're not seeing more information on the product. So what we've done now, uh, which has actually just gone live as we speak this morning, is that the button, uh, the blue button, which is more details, uh, we've actually made it a little less prominent. So we're doing an A-B test now where we make it um, a white button with just gray letters or just a blue outline, just to see if we can make it a little less um, obvious for, for people to, uh, to click on, uh, which has already uh, brought us some good results. Um, so these, again, are, are two examples of things that we saw just based on eye tracking. If you would ask people what they would see here, 
um, then they would actually see, oh, I see, yeah, that you have different products. But that's the difference between the conscious and the subconscious or the unconscious. Um, if you ask them, did you see there were other products, they probably would have seen it, but they didn't notice it. So that's uh, where we actually have to go into uh, the more detail and do a little bit of A-B test to see the actual results. Um, the, the thing that uh, Lynette just notices, uh, the mentioned as well is that the whole team has to be present during the test and that is something that is uh, really valuable to us because the product owner and the designer that are actually witnessing the test, it brings them a lot closer to the end user. Um, any given day they'll be sitting behind their desk creating great stuff but they never know what the response is until we do another test. So when they're actually there witnessing this test live in a different room and even in a different country sometimes, they're able to connect with the researcher or the consultant that's sitting down with these end users and asking them specific questions like, hey, I noticed that they're looking at this and this, can you ask this follow-up question? Um, so it's extremely valuable, not just for the outcome, but also for the engagement of everybody within our teams to connect with the end user. So if, if any of you are, are on the fence whether or not you should do it, try it at least because it will bring a lot of valuable insights and engagement for, for your whole team. Um, so with that, um, uh, we want to have a little bit more time on QA because we've been talking straight for about 28 minutes now uh, and we'd love to have uh, some of your thoughts or questions. Anybody have a question for Lynette or for me? Can you show the device? Is that the device that the, the, I don't think you brought um, the device, did you? I don't have the device with me. Um, but they're not wearing anything. Uh, yeah. For the mobile testing and for website testing, they're actually not wearing anything. So, yeah. They are just uh, basically as per normal. The user is as per normal. The eye tracker is actually this black bar here that sits at the, that's attached to the monitor screen. And that's the actual eye tracker. So um, if you're talking about wearing something, um, there is another eye tracker called um, the glasses, um, but that's mainly used for uh, eye tracking in a real world environment. So when you're tracking in, um, let's say, a uh, shopping mall or navigation, uh, train station or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, for the mobile, it's also just like this. Um, this then is um, actually just there to help prop the uh, to help prop the tablet or the mobile device uh, so that it sits at an incline and then um, it actually holds a camera at the top. Then the eye tracker which is also that same black small piece of black bar actually sits at the bottom so the user doesn't wear anything. Do you know what kind of data is the provider? Is this the eye movement or the direction? Uh, it does have people dilation data, so um, that one is more for the raw data export. Yeah, it does provide people dilation data, but it also provides um, the actual eye tracking videos like this, so you know where their eyes actually travel to fixations. Other outputs would be like heat maps, gaze plots. So gaze plots is where. Um, you actually know from one spot to the other how exactly the eye actually traveled from point one to point two, three, four, five. And then um, other outputs will actually also be um, actual study states. So for example, um, how long did they actually look at a particular button, for example, or even the number of fixations, how many times they actually looked at it. We all have the webcams on our devices. Uh, I wonder uh, uh, when that technology will be uh, on our mobile phones, tablets. It is actually coming soon. Okay. Um, uh, the eye tracker company called um, Toby Pro, they are or Toby, they are actually um, experimenting now with um, MSI and Dell laptops to actually incorporate eye trackers into those laptops. Do you plan to edit on your mobile application? I know to go here, for example, as a mobile uh, application that provide direct feedback actually from real users. It's, it's being thought of, uh, but at this point of time, it's a little bit hard to execute for mobile devices.
Uh, okay, um, modern eye trackers now, they actually use something called um, the pre uh, people corneal reflection, people center corneal reflection, PCCR. So what it does is actually each of these eye trackers actually emits, um, has infrared illuminators. So what it does is that it actually um, shoots out um, infrared light um, and that actually reflects off a person's uh, pupil and the cornea. And that reflection um, on the eye is actually tracked back into the software that reads it and, that input, and there's an algorithm that actually Toby uses to calculate exactly and to map out where the gaze points are of <coughs> um, X and Y um, coordinates. Do you have the statistics of false positives? Uh, false positives? I mean, it's actually not exactly looking at it as that as far as actually doing something else in time. Okay, uh, statistics for it, uh, not exactly, but there's always a uh, calibration process that actually happens before the actual testing is being done. So that calibration process actually um, calibrates every, because everybody's eyes are different. So that calibration process actually um, maps out uh, how accurate the eye will be and then the algorithm within the software actually adjusts for it and so the actual output on the videos and things like that uh, will actually be accurate. As for how inaccurate it can be, um, usually there's sometimes about a one to two degrees um, difference. If I wanted to start doing my tracking for my project or my future project, how much will the setup cost? Okay, um, there are. If you want to buy the equipment, uh, for the website, for that black bar <laughs> over there, that's the X230. Uh, that itself, the hardware alone itself costs um, 7000 For the software, the Toby Studio that comes along with it, that's another 19000 Singapore dollars. So yes, the software costs more than the hardware. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, at Objective, we also read this out, um, and so um, you can get the entire set for about, um, I think it is 500 a day, or 2,500 uh, 2, for a month. Um, or if not, uh, we actually also offer consultancy services, like how we work with GoBet, to actually uh, work partner together with you to actually conduct your eye tracking testing. Um, right now, because um, Gobert is launching a lot of countries, right now our emphasis is on um, doing the test after soft launch so that we can iron out any issues that we have before we go to commercial launch. Um, so for each new country, that's, that's the rhythm that we're working together. Um, and for Singapore, which is the, the, the eldest country uh, we launched March last year, that's what we'll repeat once every three to six months or when we have a new product. Um, and that's you know where we have to do a specific test, for example. Um, for the for next year, when we have the countries established for at least six to twelve months, we'll repeat um, as, as as we see fit. So there's not we have two week sprints. So that means we change our website every two weeks. Um, so it wouldn't make sense for us to do that every week because sometimes it's just smaller sprints. But when there's a big change in the UI, when there's a new product, then definitely we would engage. If we're talking about two to three years down the line where we're established thoroughly, when all the products that we want in are in, then you would probably have to repeat every quarter at least. That's, well, that's my personal opinion. But it really depends on how often you change your product or your service. Um, but the thing that Lynette also mentioned, if you want to integrate the, 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 the simplified testing into your sprints, uh, I would recommend doing just the day in your sprint. So if your sprint starts on Monday, your designers are finished with the first design uh, prototype of sketch on Tuesday, run the test on Wednesday, have the team witness that, they can already iterate the design, have them ready by Thursday or Friday for the development team to actually start working on the following week. 
that's that's doable. You have to be very quick, but it's doable if, if you just limit the tasks or you actually limit um, um, the things that you want tested. Uh, then it'd be very possible to do it every single two weeks. We, we're not there yet. We're not that fast yet. But, um, that, that'd be great to do it that fast. Do you know if somebody is doing it? Two weeks? Yeah, like having somebody in the team. Not to my knowledge. I don't know, Lynette, do you know anyone who does it in every sprint? Uh, no. There, there, um, there is always that perception that um, life is a thing that's always expensive and hard to manage and, and it takes so much effort to um, do it. But um, actually, right now, we are actually creating um, agile uh, user testing such that it can actually fit within your cycle. So uh, the consultant or the researcher basically um, has to be somewhat embedded within even your own uh, project team. So they are actually on the ball every time something new happens. And then um, taking that information, they can immediately just um, write out on the spot um, a test script within an hour and then you can just test it in the next thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned about some cultural differences and you reassured the Thai website and the uh, Malaysian website. So what are the things normally that you do differently that you do on a Thai version of the website in Malaysia? You know, the cultural differences you like, mean? Which you observed uh, while using this um, the, they're In the end, at the beginning you'll, you'll think, all right, the, the, the Thai consumer is not a Malay consumer. The Malay consumer is not a... Vietnamese consumer, and that, that is very true, they're all different cultures, but if I look at the statistics after two months of Crunchy Bean Live, we're all human. <laughs> this, that's, that's, that's really a fact, so whether or not they use a mobile device, or if they use a desktop, what time they serve, what time they actually click out, what browsers they use, um, how much time they spend, really it's within a 10% margin across the region. Um, the cultural differences that come in, um, are, are noticeable as such in Hong Kong, for example, when we did our last testing. Um, they're, they're more advanced online users, so they're faster and they're, they're, uh, they're more critical users. Um, whereas in, in the Philippines, for example, they're more easygoing. Their general infrastructure is not very good, not very stable. So if a page loads in four or five seconds, they're okay, because all pages load in four or five seconds. In Hong Kong, not acceptable, because everything is fast, so why would this be slower than that? Um, wording does make a difference. So the functionality, not as much. But in Thailand, they, they, they like, I mean, the language itself is very poetic. So very direct wording doesn't work very well with the Thai consumer in general. Um, so it has to be a little bit more explanatory. It has to be a little bit softer, um, a little bit more polite even. Whereas in the US or in Europe, we can be very direct, very short sentences. So those things you would notice. But in the end, yes. We are all human, and we act pretty much the same. I think um, we have time for one more question. Is that right, timing-wise? Okay, all right, we have a couple of questions. Uh, have, have you done any uh, A-B testing on the uh, improvement you've made uh, before and after on, on the live environment, on the live site? Yeah, so, so after, after we've done the change, um, then we actually compare the numbers. So that there's no longer an A-B test after we actually put it onto production. Um, if we do an A-B test on production, then we can um, look at the original and maybe one, two, or three uh, options. And that's the actual A-B test. After we've chosen one of the options and put that in production, then we can only look at the historical numbers compared to the current numbers. And we also do that. So we, we measure absolutely everything. So we always look at the, the before and after effects. But preferably, we, we only make a choice during the A-B test, and only when we're sure we'll implement it. Sorry, it's another question. It's just about that dot that you showed in the eye tracking. Uh, there may be different ways to interpret it, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that when the dot is drawing, it, it is something attractive to the user. It means that he is thinking more about it. It's not really clear. To yes, so, so big is not beautiful. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, um, and maybe that, that, that's where the people direction may also help. So, there, there can be a number of ways to it. Yeah. I think it also relates to the, the, the question the gentleman asked before the false positives. Um, looking at something for a while will grow the, the, the mark, but it doesn't mean that that's interesting. It could also be that they're, you know, thinking of groceries at that point, but they're just staring at the screen. 
Um, so it's, it's not 100% accurate, but it, it, it is 95% accurate. Um, the eye tracking actually tells you something about the current design. It doesn't tell you whether it's good or not, and it doesn't tell you whether there's better options or not, but it does give you an insight onto what you have today. Uh, it's up to the design team and the UX team to really come up with better options based on those insights and statistics. It will not tell you whether it should be green or blue or round or square. It's just gonna tell you whether or not they notice it. Um, I think one of the, the, the biggest things that we always put up as objective is, will they use it? If there's a new feature, will they use it? Which means, will they notice it? And will they actually engage with it? Um, that's all you can really tell. You can't really see if it's the best option. You can just get insight from what it is today. Uh, yes, the eye tracking actually tells you um, what of um, what the person is actually looking at, what their visual behavior is. Um, and if, if you're asking about, um, and, and which is one of the reasons why we actually, um, I mentioned before, the retrospective thing about with eye tracking. So what we do is that we actually play back the video with the eye tracking data back to the user to the test um, participant, and then we ask them, why were you looking at this? Why were you looking at that? Why did you behave in such a way? Why did you click on this button and not the other button? And that's where you get the, uh, even um, deeper insights into uh, the reasons behind the behavior. One last question. Yes. Uh, so, Sarah, you mentioned that you have a questions and your time and I hope it brings you insights as well um, and that's a wrap for us thanks very much